Hashkivenu, Hashkivenu, Adonai Eloheinu leshalom, leshalom. In 1974, we belonged to B'nai Yashurn. Rabbi Rosenthal was the main rabbi at that time who was considering retirement. Rabbi Rube was the associate rabbi, and he was never being considered to become the main rabbi, which is what he had worked for and been there all those years for. A group of us decided to break away and form our own little synagogue. We chose as a name was Bethenu, which means our home. When Bethenu broke away from Heights Temple, my parents were one of the founding members. I was actually the first bat mitzvah there. We were married there. And so I've been involved with the temple for a very long time. Adonai Eloheinu l'shalom When we had children, it was very important for us to belong to a temple. Even before we had kids, we were going from temple to temple because we wanted to have a religious home. I chose Beth Inu for the family atmosphere, the strong uh, community, and a place where I could raise my children in a close environment. There is something about when you walk into a small synagogue, everybody knows everybody. I liked the families that were there. Ron and I felt they were like us. So being involved with it was more of you were going to temple to be with your friends. I went to the grocery store. I always built in 15 extra minutes. So when I ran into a congregant, that I would have that time to, to kibitz with them and catch up on their family. And that's how it always was. I mean, that's community. I mean, that was really special. I mean, people don't know how special Cleveland is. We have so many other Jewish options that ought to fit everyone's belief in, in, in Judaism. The reason I picked Beth Anu is I like the atmosphere, I like the rabbi, and it was close to my backyard. I could have walked over to B'nai Jashur and it wasn't that much farther, but it is a question of comfort. Uh, do I prefer to be in a sanctuary with 3,500 people on, on the holidays or 1,000? I picked Beth Anu because it was smaller, it was much more uh, Congenial, it was much more friendly, uh, and I really enjoyed my time with Rabbi Rube. Rabbi Rube helped keep us together, and as we say in our religion, Hamisha, very down to earth, and it was just a great congregation. Inevitably, the congregation shrunk. We peaked about two years before I became president at about 420 members. The board would sit around and try and figure out why we were losing members. I would say there were a couple things. One is, I'll go to the economy. So you go to 2007, and people making choices on whether to belong to a synagogue or not. Because uh, belonging to a synagogue is a financial obligation. You can only budget so much that people are going to continue paying dues and that your membership stays at the same level. If you start having decreasing membership and you're counting on your dollar bills coming in, much higher than that, then the whole budget's messed up. There's a lack of new families to bring into synagogues. I mean, the reality is there wasn't enough money coming in as what was going out. And financially, it was, uh, it was not sustainable. They thought a new rabbi would help attract new people. It was difficult to find even a rabbi to come to the synagogue because it wasn't a pretty situation. Beth Anu always was a little ahead of the curve. I caught on those types of things. We had had a female cantor for many, many years, almost as long as the temple existed. But hiring a female rabbi had a bit of controversy to it. And we found Rabbi Shapiro. 
and we said to ourselves, we're going to be kind of in the forefront. We were looking at marketing, the fact that we had a female rabbi and cantor. We did generate some membership from the, the Jewish news ads. I'm not sure the clergy campaign was as successful. It, it just didn't work. We got a few families, but not enough to sustain what we needed to balance our budget every year. When I took the position of the executive director, it became even more apparent to me how big of a decision that was. You knew something was off, you just didn't know what it was unless you were on the board, and then you figured it out. Which was a very interesting time period because you kind of learn the inner workings of what goes on behind the scenes um, versus just being a member of an organization. In the board meetings, they went through a change in, in president, and at the change in president, they also changed at the time the type of balance sheet they were showing at the board meetings. Okay, so instead of basing the balance sheets on monies in, actual monies in, they did it kind of on a pro forma basis. So the figures they were showing people were fictitious. And that was just the beginning. There was some big decisions. I mean, you know, sad to say, there was one point talked about um, melting down the silver to pay some bills. One of the members used to give them money to balance their budget. Um, so, and that's had been going on for multiple years. It's very rude awakening, the cost of keeping a um, congregation going, be it whether it is a church or uh, a synagogue or any type of organization, the costs are outrageous. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't have enough people to give us money to help keep it going. When I was president, I always looked at the synagogue as first a religious institution and then a business. And every synagogue basically is a religious institution and then a business. You have to keep focus on the religious side, and not the business. Every synagogue needs some people that really have money to be generous with their money. Um, but it's hard to always have your hand outstretched. It was a hope. If it all worked out, if people paid their dues at this time, we'd be fine. But if they were a month late, we're in trouble. We budget, there's always a gap, and we you know, pray that, uh, you'll, uh, that, that God will provide us with, with the funds. It is faith-based, and you really always feel like there's, there's, there's this um, savior that's going to come in and fund it or um, make things right or that that God's not going to let you close. It costs money to turn the lights on, and you know, God doesn't pay the electric bill, unfortunately. They lost focus on the religious aspect of it, and they take, made a business decision that we have to do something about the religious school, and they, they took the religious school and they moved it out of Beth Anu building into Akiva. Yes, that's probably financially a good decision, but it's not going to generate members and it's going to irritate the members that are there because you lose connection with the synagogue. When the problems started being identified, especially with the finances, the biggest problem I think for me as a person, as a member, was the closing of the religious school. That just hit home. Whoa, something is going on here. We can't even afford to educate our children. I don't think any of us realized just how what the dire straits were for the temple, how, how big deal the money was. So if you really wanted to sustain the practice and sustain the operation, you had to keep it kind of hid. And they did. If you people asked and they wanted to be on the board, people were welcome to come on the board and they would, they would figure it out at the first meeting. But if you tell the whole congregation of however many people, they will, they will leave the organization. It's just like a company going under. I think the hard part on a religious organization is it's a business and it's also a religious organization. Where does the line get drawn on it? How to keep something running efficiently while still delivering, I'll call it the end product, which is religion. The same problems have always been there, that there's just never enough money to run a synagogue. Although the last year I was president, we did have to cut salary and benefits by 10%. Some of us, including myself, were reluctant to say that this isn't working, that maybe there isn't a long enough future here. We had two options, to close 
or to go with another synagogue as a group. I got some notification from the temple, my wife and I, that there was going to be a meeting to discuss merging with B'nai Jishurim. We had to kind of all sign, I don't want to say contracts, that we were going to come over to B'nai Jishurim. B'nai Jishurim wanted to know how many people Beth Ainu was bringing with them. B'nai Jishurim was very concerned about our financial situation because we owed people money. We were going to end up, even with selling the building, not paying a dollar for a dollar to people that we owed money to. The way that it closed and what happened and how people didn't know and there were all kinds of questions and really bothered me. It hurts probably more because I don't think they made the right decisions that led to the closure and I don't think they made the right decisions after the closure. And I think it's more of an acquisition because it really didn't merge. You know, when synagogues merge, it's beneficial to both, you know, to both parties and um, it was more of an absorption. The merger was kind of in a way nice as opposed to it completely dying. It still had some legacy to it. God himself probably couldn't have saved the temple at that particular point in time. They all say the same, same thing. It's nice, it's not the same. It's a tough thing to describe. And it was a tough thing when it closed. It's a changing times. People do not feel the need as much to belong to a synagogue. They don't need a building to be Jewish. We as adults don't, don't necessarily rely on the synagogue to form that, that uh, social being. I feel like I would like a temple, but not to be Jewish. But I feel I would like to have a temple to bring the Jewishness into my everyday life more. Because right now it's there only if I bring it, but to be part of a group in a building, listening to services, going through the prayers, listening to the sermon, understanding the Torah portion of the week, to me that would enrich my life even more. I don't feel that saying the prayers at the synagogue does much for me, but I do feel being at the synagogue saying the prayers with other people does something for me. You don't need a temple to be Jewish. Jewish is an identity. It's how Jewish you want to be. If you want to be more Jewish, you join a more religious temple or more religious organization, and less Jewish you don't. I know it's just a building, but there is a feeling of support and a feeling of that I am Jewish. And to me, being Jewish is not um, is not the you know how I follow the religious um, teachings. It's it's about community to me. I was raised Orthodox. Um, so I believed pretty strongly that the Torah uh, was the Word of God. No one asked where are our Torahs going, interestingly enough. They asked where are we going. I, <laughs> where do the Torahs go? I don't know. You know, it's funny. I, are they at B'nai Yashurim? I have no idea where the Torahs go. I don't know what happened to the Torahs. Toas went to different synagogues that we have no idea where they're at now. Physically, they moved from Beth Anu to B'nai Jashur, and I helped walk them over there. And I don't know what happened to all the covers, and I mean, it was sad to see um, the last few days when they were selling off all the uh, prayer books and all the um, mezuzahs and all the things that were there. I mean, people were coming in and buying the pews and they were buying the flags and they bought all the books and the papers. It was just, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to a garage sale, but how, you know, they offer you a quarter for this and a quarter for that. It was kind of sad. It was a real bittersweet time to watch them selling off all these I know they are things, but they're meaningful to us who were there. Well, hopefully the Torah's found a new home somewhere for someone else. I think the Torahs are inside you, you know, the stories and what's there. I think 
think it's what you make of your life. I, I really do. It affects every part of who you are, whether you, you know it or not. It may not be in the forefront, but it's in your subconscious. And so it's, the tour is inside of you. Since the closing of Beth Anu, um, I think I've lit in Shabbat candles twice. I'm sorry, I hate to say, admit that. <laughs> um, I, I lost a big part of me when Beth Anu closed. My involvement has really changed. You know, and I always can, I always say it's not B'nai Yashurun's fault, because I'm sure if I chose to show up and be part of it, they would make me feel a part of it. Um, but I hate to say, I've become a two day a year Jew. It didn't really change my views about being active at all. I just realized how a religious organization ran with a very slim budget. The aftermath of losing something that's so important in your life, you can't replace that. And so what you find is people are kind of lost as to where to go. And you know, call it not to be trite, kind of you got to be the last scene and fiddler of the roof. Things change. You got to pick up and go someplace else. And some things that you know may not always be there. My wish is for this next generation that doesn't have the Beth Anu, that wherever they end up, that that becomes their home. As far as being um, my whole experience of belonging to Beth Anu, I wouldn't trade. It was a great experience and it's a good feeling. Page 285. Let's continue together. Let the time not be distant, O God, when all shall turn to you in love, when corruption and evil shall give way to integrity and goodness, when superstition shall no longer enslave the mind, nor idolatry blind the eye. O may all created in your image become one in spirit and one in friendship, forever united in your service. Then shall your realm be established on earth and the word of your prophet fulfilled. Adonai will reign forever and ever. Then